Welcome to Small Arm Solutions. Uh, today we're going to be looking at probably what some would consider the finest assault rifle ever built. Uh, this is the FN SCAR 17 7.62mm rifle. Uh, before I get into that, I just wanted to uh, apologize. It's been a couple weeks since we've been able to put anything up. I've actually been on travel, uh, so I really haven't had a chance uh, to do anything up until now. Uh, but now we're back. Um, I also wanted to thank several of my viewers out there. Uh, they know who they are, who are making my work a little bit easier by uh, loaning me firearms that I'm going to be able to uh, bring you guys more videos on. Um, there's a lot of guns out there I want to do videos on that I may not have access to. Uh, and some of you actually may have access to those. Uh, so anybody who'd be willing to, uh, to send in uh, specific types of rifles uh, that they want videos on, um, I'm definitely uh, open to that. Uh, and that basically benefits us all. Um, you know, a lot of the older type rifles, uh, you know, I don't have access to. For instance, uh, one of the biggest problems I had was Colt rifles. We have a gentleman now out of uh, Arkansas uh, who is going to be able to provide me with some Colt rifles, so we'll be able to do some more uh, Colt uh, videos for you guys, uh, amongst some others. The FN SCAR-17 has been uh, probably one of the most popular uh, weapons out there right now. Um, it's, it's history. It is sort of shrouded in secrecy for the most part. Uh, not a lot of people know about where it came from, how it got to where it did. Um, it all came out of uh, a special need from SOCOM. Uh, the SCAR program, or SCAR, is actually a military acronym, a Special Operations Combat Assault Rifle. It was a requirement that was put out, oh, I would say in the around 2006, 2007 time period uh, was when it came out. There was a competition for SOCOM to have their own assault rifle. Uh, it came out of a need uh, of SOCOM having difficulty with the M4 carbines. Uh, they had specific requirements they needed the M4s to, uh, to, to meet, and that was very different from what the Army uh, had in mind. And Cole was unwilling, or unable, whichever way you want to look at it, to make the changes that were necessary. Uh, due to the fact that the M4 and M4A1 were actual TDP guns, they were actual guns that had um, national stock numbers that were required to be made to certain drawings, uh, Colt would not modify them. So there was no question that Crane wanted a rifle that they could have, that they would be the project manager on. They would be the ones who would be able to say, okay, it needs to do this, 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 and this, and then in midstream we can change that without having to get any approval from the big army. So hence the program uh, went forth, uh, Colt had had in uh, three entries, uh, and then of course the, the FN entries. Now, there was two weapons platforms uh, that came with the SCAR. There was one known as the SCAR Light, and one was known as the SCAR Heavy. The SCAR Light was chambered in 5.56 millimeter. The SCAR Light uh, was the one that was produced for the actual trials. The SCAR Heavy, on the other hand, was going to be a 7.62. That one needed to be on paper. Uh, there did not need to be any working prototypes of that yet. Uh, so the uh, the first one to be looked at was the actual SCAR uh, Light. Well, the SCAR, the SCAR Light actually had won the competition. Um, there was a lot of conjecture uh, on the way the program was conducted and who the actual winners were. Um, digging in deep and talking to some of the guys that were there at the time, the, uh, there was no clear-cut winner. Uh, the Type C SCAR that uh, Colt produced was an external piston-driven rifle. That was neck and neck with the FN SCAR uh, light uh, throughout all of the testing. Uh, it was not ever seen that either one of them was better than the other uh, because they performed equally. Uh, at the end, it came down to talking to the guys who were there and saying, what did you like better? And most of them said they preferred the FN because they saw more of a feature in it. They actually looked at the SCAR, uh, the Colt Type C SCAR, and said it looked like more of just a version of what we already had. Um, there could have been some politics in there. I, I guess I wouldn't say whether or not that there was. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, uh, it was really came down to what these individuals liked better versus the mechanical end of it. So the SCAR Type C uh, went into the past and the FN became the gun of the future. Now, at that same time, FN did have uh, working prototypes of their Type C SCAR, uh, the, the Model 17. It was uh, called the Mark 17. Now, the two differences is the, uh, the military designation is Mark 17 and Mark 16, and then the uh, commercial version are the SCAR 16S and 17S. Uh, the, the S means they're semi-automatic only. A couple of years went into actually trying to get the SCAR light up and going. Uh, the SCAR light had come up with many, many issues throughout that time period. Um, those included problems with the lower receiver uh, being polymer. They experimented with a lot of that. There was uh, some failure issues that they dealt with. 
At the same time, um, the problems that Colt had had, or they had had with Colt's rifles, uh, the M4s, had been addressed. Uh, the issues with providing a heavy barrel, uh, as well as getting rid of the bursting going to auto, some improvements to the bolts, uh, and once those problems were corrected, um, when you look, the SOCOM guys look back and they say, well, I don't see any benefit of continuing with the SCAR light over the M4A1s. The M4A1s are doing exactly what we want them to do. Uh, they were more familiar with them. Uh, it, there was, for all intents and purposes, uh, there, there was just literally no benefit. So the Navy officially dropped the SCAR light program in favor of the guys using the uh, existing uh, improved M4A1 carbines. Well, the SCAR Heavy um, was not dropped. Uh, the SCAR Heavy, there's a lot of weapons platforms that it was to replace. Uh, for instance, the SCAR 17 or the Mark 17 was a true assault rifle. Everything that was in, in service at that time, even with SOCOM, that was chambered 7.62 millimeter was a designated marksmanship rifle or a sharpshooter rifle or a sniper rifle. Uh, the M110, uh, the Mark 11s, None of these rifles were actually designed to fire full auto. They were designed for precision use. And when several of the SEALs who I had spoken to compared, for instance, the uh, Mark 17 against the M110, they found very little difference in accuracy. The, uh, there is a, a longer barrel, I believe it's a 21 or 24 inch barrel that, uh, that came, on for, came for the Mark 17 that provided incredible accuracy. Um, the recoil of the Mark 17 was very moderate, even compared to that to the M110. Uh, the guys liked it. Uh, it replaced not only the, as, a, as an assault rifle, but also these designated marksman rifles. The barrel was, was interchangeable uh, by removing uh, these two screws here or loosening them and removing two in the front. The barrel was actually able to be removed and you were able to go with shorter barrels. They were set up for sound suppressors right off the bat. Uh, there was a valve which allowed you to go from uh, unsuppressed to suppressed, uh, which would slow the gun down quite a bit. Uh, so there was a lot of benefits of having one weapons platform replace multiple other 7.62 platforms. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go over this thing from uh, from butt to muzzle and we're going to see uh, what exactly it is and there's a couple enhancements that we're going to talk about as well. Uh, this is going to be a two-part series. Uh, the, this first part series is going to be on the gun itself, uh, the mechanics of it, what it is. Uh, the second part is going to be on accessorizing it. Uh, there's several companies that have made uh, are making livings off right now actually making uh, uh, improvements, uh, making improved rail systems, cocking handles and whatnot. So there's a whole industry out there right now dedicated to, uh, to enhancing uh, this weapon system as well. So I think we're actually going to jump right in. For those of you who are familiar with the SCAR light, they look identical, uh, except one looks just oversized uh, to handle the 7.62 caliber cartridge. Um, looking at the rear, this comes in two different colors. Uh, you can either get black or the flat dark earth. Uh, the most popular one is the flat dark earth just due to the fact that that's the one that was adopted by uh, SOCOM. The stock is, is adjustable for uh, length for your cheek weld as well as side folding. If you look on the side, we have the adjustment. The cheek weld itself, by pushing a button, we can drop down. I actually have it up because I have an optic on here and this actually puts my uh, eye right in, the, right in the proper alignment with the optic. And also, it closes. So you actually have uh, an ability to you know, carry this thing even more compact. You do have a, a butt plate in the side. You have in the back here an, open, an opening... Uh, excuse me. You do have on the back here the butt pad that opens up where you can actually place uh, batteries or whatever else that you may need in there. Now the optic I chose for this is the uh, is the Spectre DR uh, by Elcan. It's a one and a half, it's a one and a half to six power optic. This is an ideal optic for this this weapon. Now one of the problems this weapon system has had is due to the design of it, the harmonics. This thing destroys optics um, right from the get go. Uh, the way the uh, the rifle works and the way the harmonics are, it's destroyed all kinds of pec fours, uh, pretty much any kind of optic uh, within you know anywhere from 1,500 to 5,000 rounds. It just uh, shakes them right loose. Now, according to Elkan, this particular optic is, uh, quote, SCAR rated. Now, this issue did not come up with the SCAR light. This is only an issue that's uh, unique to the SCAR heavy. Um, talking with uh, one of my close friends, Dick Swan, uh, when this rifle first became uh, available and was being used by uh, SOCOM, he was asked to develop a specific type of a mount that had a uh, buffer system on it that would 
either eliminate or extend the life uh, of the uh, of the optics when used on this rifle. Uh, he, he did get into it a little bit. Uh, it never actually um, amounted to anything. It uh, never went into production. A lot of the optics guys who were using uh, who were being used on these types of rifles, they went to work to try to improve their optics, uh, so they would hold up to the uh, to the abuse of this rifle. Now the upper receiver is a is a solid piece of 775 T6 aircraft aluminum. Uh, you'll see you do have a, a fire cartridge case uh, ejector. Now right here are your two screws, and one underneath underneath the rail here is what would be removed to uh, change the barrel out. You can notice I do have some of my, you know, my rail protectors on here. This is also Manta. Uh, I use them on everything. These are their flat dark earth ones. And uh, this one, this rifle gets hot. Uh, the way this thing conducts heat is unbelievable. Uh, so these are very, very useful uh, on this particular rifle. It gets hot awfully quick. For any of you who may be interested in getting any of these uh, Manta products, if you go onto their website and you go into uh, the product code SAS20, uh, you'll be able to get 20% off of anything on their uh, entire uh, web page. Now the lower receiver you'll see here, uh, we have a standard pistol grip, um, this flat dark earth, and we have the safety. Uh, the safety here is ambidextrous, uh, so you have safe and semi, um, and of course you'll have automatic on the, uh, the, the original one. You do have an oversized uh, uh, magazine release button as well, which uh, works out quite well. Now the magazine we're going to talk a little bit about. The magazine is proprietary to this firearm uh, by FN. Uh, this is basically a modified uh, foul magazine. Not the same, but it's modified. Uh, there are people who've stated that they have actually uh, cut ahead and converted some over so it will work. I'm not going to confirm or deny that. Uh, I'm just going to say that these are a proprietary magazine. They are steel. Uh, they're very well built. Uh, there's two different ones. They have, uh, again, you can see this is painted uh, so, it, so it matches the flat dark earth. They also have the ones that are straight black. Uh, it does have an anti-tilt follower. Uh, it's a very, very durable magazine. Um, this has been seen as a benefit by some and a, set, and a setback by others. First of all, these are around 40 bucks a piece. And they can, there's often times where these things dry up, you can't find them. Uh, this rifle, when it gets military contracts, this stuff just completely disappears. Uh, there are a couple different magazines for it, which we're gonna talk about in the next video with some of the aftermarket magazines. But I do want to introduce one product right now uh, that uh, I, I find very, very important uh, and I like quite a bit. As I, as I previously stated, this is a very, very expensive magazine. Uh, and if you look at the US military, uh, the only real 7.62 magazines you see in, in use right now are the uh, M110 or SR25 type magazines. There is no standard 7.62 magazine in the US military. Uh, you have guys who use the M14s or their SOCOM variations, which are M14 magazines. You have the M110s, uh, you have the Mark 11s, uh, which use the SR25 type magazines. So when this rifle was designed, uh, there was no intent in having uh, any particular magazine for it. It was designed as, uh, as a system that worked. There was no requirement for it to use any specific magazines. But um, there has been another product that I think has done extremely well. This is designed by a handle defense. This is a lower receiver that actually utilizes the standard SR25 type magazine. Now, why would you want this? Well, for those of us in the commercial uh, market, uh, these magazines are 10, 12 bucks a piece. Uh, they're everywhere, and if you're like me, uh, you have uh, a bin full of them. And it's, uh, it's much easier to use a magazine that you have tons of than go out and spend you know, 40 bucks a pop on them. Now, the US military, uh, SOCOM, has actually bought some of these lower receivers from handle defense. This is actually a, a, um, an, an alloy, a magnesium alloy, uh, which is extremely light and it's incredibly durable. Uh, it's extremely strong. Now the components that are on here also are proprietary to handle. Um, this is an ambidextrous selector lever, as you can see, has a, you know, has a, it's just quite thick, it's easy to access even with or without gloves. The, if you were to compare the uh, magazine release between the two, you'll see that the magazine release on here is a lot larger, a lot easier to reach. And then when we flip it over, you'll see we have the ambidextrous magazine release. And you will see that also um, is larger and a little bit easier to get to. Also inside of here, these all come standard with the Geisley uh, 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 SCAR trigger. Now I gotta say, for as far as triggers are concerned, um, Geisley, when I, they, they really did an incredible job on this trigger. It is much better than the standard trigger. The trigger on the standard SCAR rifle is typically what you would expect out of a military grade uh, 
a rifle around eight pounds, you know, creep. Um, you know, uh, certainly no better or worse than you know, any of your standard AR type magazines, but the, the Geisley trigger on here is, is incredible. It's two stages, a clean, crisp break. Um, I actually think that uh, my group's really improved with this trigger. I think it made that much of a difference. So having the, having the ability to go with the standard SR25 type magazines being in, you have probably a dozen if not more different uh, manufacturers out there uh, of magazines that you can use that are extremely low cost. Uh, the reliability is just as good on these uh, if anything. The, uh, this is also set up to use the X Products uh, drum magazine, 50 round drum magazine. Now uh, I actually tried using that and it did not fit in this the lower receiver for some reason. Uh, however, this is not the only problem I've had with uh, that X Products drum. I've had problems with that in my uh, the Colt LE901. I've had the uh, LMT 308. I had a problem getting it in that magazine well. Actually, there's only a couple rifles I've tried that did actually fit in uh, without me having to hammer it in and hammer it out. So I'm guessing that the you know the X Products drum that I have is probably just uh, you know an out of spec one or one there's there's issues with. Um, I've tried multiple magazines in this thing and it works awesome. Uh, one of my favorite ones here is actually by uh, TNH Tactical. Um, again, this, this is excellent. Now this is not cheap. You're looking around five, six hundred dollars for this lower receiver. I do have to say uh, there are people out there who will claim that why would I want to go out and spend three thousand dollars for a rifle and then go out and spend another five hundred bucks for a lower for another lower receiver. Well, I'll tell you this. I think that it's uh, definitely worth having the uh, ability to use the entire bit of magazines that I have here, uh, that it's that it's uh, you do save money in the long run. Not to mention the design of this one. I think it definitely is, uh, is, is much stronger, more durable than the standard uh, one that comes with it. This magnesium alloy uh, is incredible. Uh, if you were to compare this to um, the weight of this, of this polymer one that comes with it versus the uh, you know the solid aluminum uh, ones that come out, this one weighs right in the middle of the two. Uh, so you have that extra uh, durability uh, and, uh, and, and, and lightweight. Uh, so I do think this is an excellent product. Okay, okay going back. Now for as far as the uh, cocking handle, as you can see it's on the side here, this is reciprocating. Meaning that when you fire it does come back. It is adjustable from left to right side. You can you can uh, you can move that over. So you, if you want on the right, you can put it over here. I will show you when we disassemble how to do that. There are uh, three 1913 rails on here as it comes from the factory. You do have backup sights as well. Uh, this is adjustable for windage and elevation. You also have a, a, a large aperture and a small aperture depending on what uh, distance you're at. The front sight actually folds in place. You have a button here. Where you can we lift up on that. So it's, uh, it's similar to like an AK uh, in the way that it is. It's, an M, it's a standard M16 type uh, four position uh, square front sight post. The barrel itself uh, is an, it's an excellent barrel. It's a one in 12 inch twist. This is a cold hammer forged chrome plated barrel. So for as far as barrels go, this is probably the, well, the crown jewel. You have the benefits of everything. You have uh, the, the, it, the benefits of the hammer forged for durability. Plus you have the hard chrome in there also, which gives you two to three times the barrel life. Uh, which is uh, which is an excellent um, reliability enhancement and also for over the long haul. This is a, a muzzle brake that comes with the commercial versions. The standard military versions will have a, uh, I believe it's a Surefire, I'd have to double check on that, but a Surefire uh, a flash hider on it. Now again, it is an external piston rifle, which we're going we're to take it apart and we're going to take a look at everything. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is show you how to take it apart. The first thing we're going to look at is removal of the lower receiver. Now, the part that's serialized on this rifle is the actual receiver itself. It's not the the lower, which is so with the AR-15. So if you were to swap out uh, this one with the one we just looked at, the handle defense, there's no issue. You just ordered it in the mail. The actual receiver itself is what is, that, is what's serialized. So what we're going to do is we're going to push on that pin forward, slide forward, take out. Uh, very lightweight polymer. Uh, it's, it's very secure when it goes in and out. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to remove the stock by just pushing down. That slides right off like so. Next thing is we're going to remove the recoil spring by pushing in. Now we're going to show you how you uh, change over the uh, charging handle. 
you pull back the charging handle to right to the, to the rear here you can lift that right out you can flip it over insert it now we have it on the right side we're going to disassemble so we're going to pull it out bolt comes right out now for uh, weapons maintenance is, is very very simple one product that we're going to show you during this whole thing is, a, is for every SCAR owner, uh, I would say you have to have one of these. Uh, this is manufactured by uh, ShootingSite.com, and it is a complete SCAR tool. This has every tool that you would possibly need uh, to do any repair work or modifications or anything that you would have to do to the SCAR. Uh, there's, there's, uh, you, have, you have tools for cleaning your gas ports, you have a front sight wrench, uh, you have pretty much everything that you're going to need. So I'm just going to use uh, one of these straight edges here to pop out the firing pin retaining pin. Now you'll see there's actually a rubber uh, O-ring on here. And that rubber O-ring uh, gives you a good seal so it won't fall out. Firing pin comes right out the back. You do have a cam pin. And now the bolt comes right out. Now these are all proprietary components. Um, this is the actual... Uh, entire carrier assembly here as much as this may look like it's a long stroke it is not the actual piston uh, piston actually strikes the face of the carrier to drive it rearward now looking at the design uh, this has tremendous uh, similarities to the AR-18 and that's because it does um, this gun's operating system is very much based off of the uh, the original Armlite AR-18 or our AR-180 which many rifles are uh, that you'll see out there the, you know the CZ brand for instance um, you know, the G36, uh, or the, you know, that's the, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a system that has been applied to many, many different uh, weapons platforms. So that's really all you have for the actual mechanism itself. So the next thing we're going to look at is the actual gas system. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove the gas piston. Now this is a little more tricky uh, than I would like to say, um, but that's just the way that they did it. So we're going to use the small flathead on the uh, tool to push in the plunger and now we can rotate, we can pop out. Now the actual gas piston itself will not drop out, it's going to need a little bit of assistance. So what we're going to do, we're going to get the cleaning rod set, two rods. And there's a special tool that comes with uh, the kit. And the whole purpose of this is specifically to remove the piston itself. You see there's two slots on, on the tool itself. It goes right on the actual rail. Now we just slide that forward. And there is the piston. So again, this is a, a short stroke tap. It this this the, the piston actually will hit the will impact the front and drive it rearward. If this was a long stroke, this would all be one piece and not two separate pieces. The piston itself, as you can see, is chrome plated. Then it actually has three gas rings. Now the reason you would have gas rings on the piston itself is it enables you to have to use less gas. If you were, say, not to have those gas rings, you would just have the fit between the uh, port itself and the, and the uh, inside of the receiver. You actually would have gas that would blow back over the, uh, the, the piston itself and you would lose gas. So you would have to increase your gas flow to, to compensate for the lost gas. By having this to seal up the actual piston chamber, you um, can use less gas and it's a lot easier on the rifle, especially when you're, uh, when you're converting it over to uh, use with a sound suppressor where you're overgassing it that much more. So the, the gas valve itself uh, is a very critical part of this gun, uh, which enables you to go from uh, suppressed to unsuppressed without any uh, undue wear on the rifle itself. If you were to just switch over to suppressed without having a, unsu a uh, suppressed position, uh, you have the high gas flow plus the, the additional gas that's caused from the uh, suppressor would cause a lot of wear and tear on the rifle uh, unnecessarily and cause it to wear much sooner. The system is extremely robust, uh, it, it's durable, 
Um, I, I will say uh, when I first fired one of these on fully automatic, uh, I, don't know, I didn't really care for it. I'm used to the higher cyclic rate of the uh, of the M16 uh, AR10 type series, where you're up around 800 rounds, 900 rounds a minute. Uh, the SCAR uh, was much slower, I'd probably have to say between 6 and 7. So it was sort of hard getting used to uh, the chug, chug, chug versus a boom, 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 boom. It was, pardon my trying to make, a, make, make noises here. It, it was very hard to get used to uh, that lower. I always felt like it was sluggish to me. But I guess when you're used to it as, as what you're firing, um, it's, it's no problem. This gas system, from what I've seen so far, is not finicky on ammunition whatsoever. Uh, the primary rounds I fired in this was the Black Hills uh, M118LR, or the 175 grain OTM. Uh, I'd also put through it some uh, ZQI um, 762 NATO, uh, some uh, Federal Lake City uh, 147 grain ball, and also some uh, the HSM uh, 150 grain full metal jacket. And I've had not had any issues with it whatsoever. Um, also the SIG 168 grain uh, match hollow point. This rifle was, uh, it took everything without a problem. Um, I was I was surprised. I wasn't expecting the accuracy out of it that uh, that, it, that, I, that it did. I'm not gonna tell you that it's up to par with, uh, you know, some of the LMTs and Knights that I've shot. Uh, it's, it's not as much of a tack driver. Again, it's not designed as it is. Uh, it's designed as an assault rifle, but it gives you um, what's needed to take those longer range shots as well. So uh, for reassembly, we insert the this in from the front. Now we have the uh, gas block itself, or the gas valve. It is not the easiest uh, to put back together. As you can see we have the gas valve back in, now we just rotate. And we want to have it in the up position, that is for normal. That would be for suppressed. Now we can push the, uh, the latch up and fold the uh, sight back down. Now I want to say one thing about the muzzle brake while we're here. It's got one hell of a blast to it, but this muzzle, bl muzzle brake works incredible for as far as uh, taking care of recoil. Uh, I was very pleased with this performance. Um, this, this rifle will definitely benefit from a sound suppressor compared to having this muzzle brake on it. but. Uh, for, for, for range work, it's excellent. Now, if you're going to be using this as an assault rifle, I would remove that and put a flash suppressor on it. Uh, perhaps something like a, uh, a Smith Enterprises Vortex. Now, looking at the bolt carrier group, we're going to insert the, uh, the bolt from the front. We want to make sure that the extractor is facing the right side. We're going to insert the, the cam pin. We'll make sure that it's uh, that the cam pin's facing the direction of the bolt. Now we just drop the frame pin in from the rear. Insert the frame pin chain pin from the right, and you may it certainly would not hurt to give it a little bit of a love tap because it does uh, this sort of force fit in there. Now to reassemble back into the rifle. Now we're going to insert the uh, recoil spring. Drop the stock on. Now I will say when you pull the bolt back on this thing, this is incredibly smooth. And we'll do its function check. Safe, nothing happens. Semi. Here the click. Perfect. Now again, this optic one more time. Uh, I really felt that this optic was ideal for this rifle because again, it was a you have a, a combat type ranges out to 400 yards. Uh, it was excellent. The uh, the actual top has a pistol grip or pistol type sight, uh, so you can get something that's up, up close if you have to go from magnified to unmagnified. To change the, uh, the power of the optic, you'll see 1.5. You flip the lever down, we go over to 6 power. 
We also have multiple positions for uh, illumination to have a, uh, a, a red reticle. Uh, we can adjust it to whatever the ambient light is outside, make it uh, darker or lighter, whatever, whatever the, the situation would call for. Uh, we're going to take the SCAR-17 to the range and we're going to see how it shoots. What we have here is a SCAR-17. I have a Spectre with a 1.5 to 6 power uh, optic on it with a honeycomb in the front. We're going to try a few different kinds of magazines. Uh, we have the standard uh, SCAR magazine and we have uh, two of the Pro mags and we have one of, uh, I believe this is advanced storage components. So we're going to see how some of these aftermarket magazines work as well. Uh, the ammunition was provided by Black Hills as well as uh, ZQI. Uh, so we're going to see how this thing shoots with some of these different magazines. We're going to give the ProMag a try. Another Pro Mag.
we're going to try the uh, advanced storage components uh, 25 round magazine. I wasn't expecting this magazine to work. One of the major downfalls to the SCAR-17 uh, design, uh, I guess it would depend on your point of view, is of the fact that the magazines are proprietary. And they're proprietary and they're quite expensive. Uh, so. Actually, quite frankly, they can be very rare to get a hold of as well. What if they could make it using a SR25 type magazine, which is the pretty much the industry standard throughout the industry? Well, that does happen. Handle Defense has designed a lower tr lower trigger module that will actually test and fire uh, pretty much any of the uh, standard P mags that are in the industry. So all we have to do is swap out the lower receiver, and it's done just like so. Again, we're going to check and make sure that we're empty. We're going to pop upward on the lock. Pop the lower receiver right off. Now we're ready to go. The magazines that we have here, the Knight's Armament Magazine, Brownells, uh, PMAG Gen 3, uh, Lancer uh, Vets Warfighter magazine and the uh, Teenage Tactical.
Easy Mag Gen 3. Nitro Systems uh, L7 Advanced Warfighter Magazine. Accuracy of this rifle, I was really, really impressed with. Uh, with the Black Hills 175 grain open tip match, I had one group of, uh, of five rounds that was uh, just around a half inch. Uh, I had another group that was, uh, I believe it was 10 shots, or 10 shots was, was, was about uh, one inch. And I had one group of 20, which was about an inch and a quarter uh, off of a rest, which is very, very, is excellent accuracy out of, a, out of an assault rifle. Uh, the barrel is still brand new, uh, clean, um, and all that ammunition was all the Black Hills uh, 175 green uh, M118 LR. Now the other ammunition I tested, uh, you know, they were they, the groups were all pretty much similar. Um, we're going to show you, uh, you know, the best groups that I had had, uh, but uh, those were also using the handle defense uh, lower with the uh, Geisley trigger. Uh, that was not the standard uh, stock trigger. I don't believe I would have done as well uh, with the standard uh, FN triggers I did with that uh, the Geisley. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did please click like and please subscribe. Thank you very much.